Casey's is a premier garden center and gift shop located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Casey's offers a wide selection of plants, landscaping materials, home and garden decor, and gifts for every occasion. Casey's is committed to providing exceptional service, a unique shopping experience, and value to every customer. Stop in and see what makes Casey's so unique. Located at 21481 State Line Road, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, or call 812-537-3800. Let Casey's help you add beauty to your home. Welcome to Strong Dads. This is Merle Hutchinson and Kyle Crawford bringing you another great show today. Uh, this is messed up. <laughs> continue. All right, I'll, continue. I'll go ahead yeah, and yeah. continue. Today we have one of the smartest, good-looking studs that we have ever had on Strong Dads. He is an amazing husband, father, and friend. I would like to welcome... Kyle Crawford to the Strong uh, Dads podcast. Great intro. Kyle, how are you doing? <laughs> wow. I asked Kyle to write an intro for the show, and this is what I get. Oh, my God. I'm the guest on the show. I, I feel like to, I have to go to... brush my teeth now, wash my mouth out after that garbage I'm, I'm, that just came out of my mouth. I'm very flattered <laughs> that you would say all those nice things about me, Merle. It's not what you said before I hit the record button. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on today? Not much. Not much at all. You know, uh, <clears throat> kind of fighting the cold here, not the COVID. It's mm. a sinus thing. Yeah. The sinus thing. I think it's thing. going around. Yeah. It's just like. You know, part of what happens in winter in the great Midwest. Mm -hmm. So, That's fighting right. that. That's right. Uh, flew out to uh, Utah over the weekend. Yeah, you got the old shots in the knee, right? I got some PRP injections. I, I screwed that up in the last show. I like, I forgot, I lost my mind, but it's platelet rich plasma. Okay. And so, got a heavy duty concentration. Um, got uh, seven shots in one knee and six in another. Mm. Uh, that's always joyful experience. Mm. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, did that. That's out around Park City. So I, that was the first time I actually went up into Park City. Okay. And uh, went up there, um, spent a couple hours just walking around. Pretty cool. So, but I literally flew in on Thursday after seven hour delays of flight, mm. which that was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then I hop on this this thing called a plane might as well be a sardine <laughs> and then yeah that was ridiculous i i, I hate flying anymore mm. there's you, you can't do anything more to make flying worse than yep. what the airlines do what they, they almost like dehumanize you it's just like stand yeah. in line you know just take take your shoes off you know it's take your belts off I mean, yeah it, and it's i terrible. get it like this is for your security yeah i get it but but and i'm okay with some of that part but when you get on the plane I mean, it is just ridiculous. I'm not a huge guy. <laughs> I don't know how a guy bigger than me even sits in these chairs. Yeah. You know, I mean, <clears throat> it, it, the whole thing is stupid. I, yeah. I'm sitting there thinking, take take two max three rows of seats out of here, and everybody can breathe. Yeah. And and you probably still aren't going to go out of business. <laughs> I, the whole again, I'm on my little rampage, but I'm like, <laughs> why would anybody want to fly? So I've come to the idea that if I can drive it in eight hours i'm not flying it because yep. there's there's no like my total time of flying to utah i had left at uh about five in the morning didn't get until 10 o'clock at night wow you know i was just this is ridiculous joy joy happy yeah. happy <laughs> <laughs> anyways anyway, anyways what, yeah, what, that's what, not what the show's no, about no what, yeah. what are we what are we talking about today since I, i'm the guest you I, are the guest thank you for being a guest <laughs> on strong dad so we, we are in part of our series of defense and yep. so the things that we need to learn to defend as men as strong dads in our home in our marriage there are certain things that we need to step up and be aware of and yep. then have actually a thought of well what does that look like in my house mm. all right and so um last time we just talked about how we how we kind of need to de-escalate hot situations yep. so that we don't have battles in relationships and in our home and our marriage like how do we de-escalate these things so that we don't have to get into the battle okay sure. but this week we're going to actually be a little bit more practical um, and we're going to start off with being more concrete, and that is like the actual defense of your home. Mm. And so we brought Kyle Crawford in because this is what you do for a living, yeah. right? I mean, through the whole fire and damage and those kind of things, you guys are called into these kind of situations all the time as a fireman. 
Um, hopefully, you know, you talked last week about the idea that you, even though you enjoy fighting fighters, a biggest, the biggest part of your training is actually in preventative and yep. teaching preventative. Yep. Okay. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the preventative side. Let's thank a couple of our sponsors and then let's get into the practical sense of what we need to be aware of and defend in our home. I like it. Strong dads. We would like to thank Casey's Outdoor Solutions for coming alongside of us. Really do appreciate Casey's. Uh, they are a premier garden center located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Um, check them out. Home decor, awesome landscaping needs. Um, yeah, for sure. Check them out. Let, let them know that we sent you down there and really do appreciate Casey's Outdoor Solutions for coming alongside of us. All right. Good deal. We also would like to thank the Crimer's Beer House located down on 128 outside of Cleves, Ohio. Uh, go down there for a great dinner and in a great location. Uh, check out the menu that Mark's got down there. Got a little German bent to it. So if you like German cuisine, yep. um, it's good stuff. But uh, lots of great food on the menu, so go check out Kramer's Beer House. Awesome, yeah. So, so you know, when when it comes to this idea uh, of of you know, is your home protected? Just similar to what you were talking about with the fire aspect. You know, we're going to get into you know, protecting our home from fires, from floods, storms, uh, intruders. Um, and, and I think that, you know, similar to what you were saying, Merle, you know, the last show we talked, the number one part of my job is prevention. And so I think it's a good place to start that, that when we talk about the, these type of, you know, actually going into protecting our home, I think it's important to note that there will never be a time when I, I, I truly don't believe where we can be 100% protect. You know, it, it, our house cannot be 100 percent right. We're always going to have a level of vulnerability. Yes, yeah, so yeah. there's always going to be. I mean, there's you know, we'll go through different steps that we can do to hopefully prevent some you know disaster from coming into your home, from some incidents from coming into your home. But I think at the end of the day, it's really important to note that I don't think it's 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 actually possible to be 100 percent protected from invasions from from storms from fires i think it's 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 good to note and a good place to start that you know it, it, th there's no way to 100 percent protect ourselves from that right i mean we just saw the folks down in kentucky and tennessee that got yeah. just blasted by a bunch of tornadoes and yep. you know um there are things that we can do you know whether the in the construction of the home mm. or uh, just getting our family away in certain situations and taking cover but yeah mother nature's mother nature right and yep. the laws of nature whether it's a fire and how it's going to start in your home i mean they are what they are and i think that is very a humbling reminder that you're not all that yep. you know there's something bigger out there yeah well you know th th this idea of, of protection i think it goes into we, we've done whole shows on, on being a provider for our family um and and last night in my small group we actually were we're in first timothy um and, and talking about being a provider for your family and being provider you know the, the first timothy 5 talks about you know being a provider for for widows mm. and and th this whole concept and this idea that 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 god is calling men to be providers and, and i think it's a great place to to it's a great reminder for us as men that you know when we look at our home we should be doing things that are protecting our family we, we should provide protection for our family again it, it's a team effort I, mm -hmm. I really believe that you and your wife need to come together to ultimately protect your kids right but i, I think at the end of the day when it comes to provision of protecting our home it, it is going to fall on us as strong dads yeah i want to point something out there i've run <laughs> into a number especially i'll just call out younger younger dads husbands that um I don't know. They get trapped in certain things of playing video games. Uh, they yeah. kind of seclude themselves from the family. They just go do their own thing. And then um, they fall asleep. And the next thing you know, mom is the one who's making sure that the doors are all locked in the house. Yeah. That Mom's making sure that security is in check. And I just feel like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. At the end of the day, when somebody breaks in your house, mm. are you going to throw your wife out in front of you? Right. You know, that doesn't mean I fall asleep often before Linda does. Sure. Okay. But when I get up, my habit is I go through and I check the doors. Yeah. Well, I, we had Linda on the show a, lo yeah. a long, long time ago. She said that was one of the things that she kind of leaves up to you. You, you. you have to go around and make sure all the doors are it's locked. It's just security and maintenance. It's yeah. like because part of my deal is... If somebody comes in the house, it's going to be on me. I'm not going to say, honey, go protect us. Yeah. You know? And so I think some of these younger guys, especially, and I just say younger guys because that's just where I see it that comes in. I mean, I have in, in um, sessions, I have these wives 
that they don't say, oh, and I, I go lock the doors. They go, and then I have to go lock the doors. Yeah. Like they actually, that does bother them that sure. they have to step up and take care of the security of the home they, yeah. because it's not natural to them. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, that's a little call out. You guys who are sitting there falling asleep <laughs> and not uh, taking care of that, get off the couch and take care of the security. Good deal. Yeah. So, so let, let, let's get into this. Um, you know, th- th- this idea that the first thing um, that, that I wanted to talk about, this idea of flood um, and protecting our home from a flood. Um, and this is really interesting and, and I'll get into it in a second. Um, I think we're, we are very fortunate for anyone that, that is listening or watching in the Cincinnati area. We, we don't live in a floodplain, right? Or, or Not unless you live in downtown or Cincinnati you- <laughs> or Lawrenceburg or yeah. Aurora or so- <laughs> Falmouth. <laughs> Well, where I live, I'm not in the floodplain. No, um, you're on the hill. So th- this idea of, of floods, I think, it is is um, maybe maybe a little foreign to some people to think about the actual idea of, of you know a a body of water that is flooding mm. and coming to our house. Um, and and not not too long ago, actually a couple of days ago, my sister's basement, my sister and brother-in-law's basement actually flooded. Mm. Um, and it's kind of crazy that you know we were you know getting ready in the midst of of, of this show and and kind of planning for the show and. It really just brought to light some things um, when it comes to that protective, you know, protecting our home from the, the idea of floods. You know, my my brother, they they spent, my brother-in-law, they spent um, money to get a backup for their sub pump. Mm. And then that backup failed, right? Mm. And, and then there's- That's there, great. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 I guess you got to have a backup to the backup, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it just, it, it really brought up, uh, and, you know, and before we even re- hit the record button on the show, you and I were just talking about this idea of, of having a generator, having an ability mm. to still, you know, function, have our house operate the way it needs to in order to prevent or, or keep a flood away from our basement. Because, you know, I mean, we, we do get heavy rains here in, in the Cincinnati area and, and wherever you're listening, I'm sure, you know, the same could be said, we get heavy rains where where especially, you know, most basements are underground. And so the natural instinct is because there's water all around right. uh, underground. So I think it's 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 good to talk about the idea of a flood, even if it is maybe not in the forefront of your mind of something that could happen to your house. You know, Kyle, I think it's kind of funny. I know uh, I'm a gun owner. Uh, you're a gun owner. So but I, I know guys who will go out and drop three, four, five, eight hundred bucks on a pistol or something, but they won't spend the money on a generator and I will promise you that over the course of your life, your generator will save you more than your gun will. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And you're just like, Oh no, I can't, I'm not going to buy one of those generators, but you'll go out and buy a $500, um, a pistol, you yep. know, and again, I'm not against the pistol at all, yep. but it's like, yeah, it's just a matter of priority here. Yep. Well, you know, we, we with obviously it's it's kind of you know you're almost like a, a reactive mindset now since we've had a a, a a disaster in my sister's house, you know, they, their basement flooded. The conversation of buying a generator is, is now where where if we would have foresight, you know, and, and forethought and be like, maybe we should have this generator for all you know everyone in our family yeah, you can share the generator and we can yeah. share the generator and, and as long then, as you're not on the same neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we we've actually you know because of that this very this very event we're we're looking at, at buying a, a generator um you know we, i've taken a little step further one thing that i'm looking at is a generator that actually can run on propane and also mm-hmm. fuel um so you know god forbid there's ever a massive power outage um and gas stations are unable to even pump gas we can still use propane so um looking at different options like that i think is a great way to get Getting in that protective mindset, I think mm-hmm. it is good for you and your family. Again, they like you know what you're talking about. They they are expensive, right? And, yeah. and it it is a kind of one of those uh, you know little painstaking upfront cost to 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 mm-hmm. invest into something like that. But when you're talking about actually having the foresight, having a vision for your family, knowing that yeah, that this six, seven, eight hundred dollar tool, right, is something that I hope I never have to use. But man, right. when I do need it man, it's going to be greatly yeah. beneficial for, for my family. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit uh, about, too, like, and this is common in our area, not just the floods, um, but the wind, like tornadoes, mm. hurricanes, mm. those kind of things. You know, this is another thing that um, I think a lot of us just buy a home, and we just don't really think about, well, how will – how is our house set up? Because the first thing that happens, like we've had several pretty good sized storms around here. We've not been hit by a tornado, but we've had some crazy wind storms and stuff. And my son's never really, I think they may have looked at me, but my daughter has always said, dad, what should we do? Yeah. I mean, so she's looking to me. 
Mm-hmm. And so I've laid out the house, you know, just in a, like, okay, here's here's what you do. So wind is, is much damaging. Like when we have a tornado or something that can come through, like that's pretty intimidating. The idea that you think about your house and direct your kids. Okay, kids, here's the deal. Here's what wind can do. And yeah. here's where we go in our house. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, in our house, we actually, when we built this house, I had the opportunity, we call it the bomb shelter. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, it's the cellar area underneath the front porch that is all concrete. Mm. And I mean, you know, it's bomb proof, yeah. so to speak. Yep. And and our kids know that, like heavy winds, tornado, yep. that's where you go. If you don't have that sort of thing, then you need to locate what it is that you do have in your home. And your kids need to know why that's where you go. Yeah. Well, th- this very idea, this is something, um, you know, Going back to my training in the fire service, um, we are there, there's a saying that floats around the fire service that if you stay, you save the staircase, you can save the house. Hmm. Um, so if you start to evaluate and look at your house and you're like, I don't have that area, um, I, I'm a firm believer underneath your staircase in your basement is, is going to be one of the safest places. Again, hmm. you know, you know, this is something in the few, you know, the, the tornado warnings that go off fairly often in, in this general area. Um, you know, we've had to bring our girls down into the basement and, and we, we, you know, tuck underneath our, our, our basement staircase. Um, and you know, it's little things like, you know, that they, they're obviously scared and they're, they're worried and they're nervous and, and, you know, we'll get into this on the fire aspect of everything too, but, you know, just reminding your kids that we don't care about any of your, your stuffed animals. We don't care about, you know, all we care about is making sure you are underneath that staircase, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, obviously it's frustrating because sometimes those tornado warnings last a while, right? right. And, and then so that they get antsy and they want to get, they want to move around and, you know, and we have windows in our basement. And again, when it comes to storms and tornadoes and, and, and such, I mean, those windows are very, very dangerous to, you know, cause you, 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 you mm-hmm. get, you know, you, you want to peek your, your eyes out there and see what's going on myself included. Right. And just the, the importance of, of telling our uh, you know jenny and i have told our girls that you know that th- this is one of those circumstances where we kind of we're, we're, we're essentially we're helpless right there, there's right. not much we can do i can't prevent a tornado from happening but what i can do is i can put them in the safest place i know in my house yeah and they need to know that like part of anxiety comes from the um, apprehension of not of the unknown right mm-hmm. and so the idea that you as a dad Um, Even if you're not 100% certain yourself, the idea that you speak it with confidence, kids, this is what we do, right? Versus you running around like you're the crazy because you don't know what to do. So you should lay it out in your head. Hey, this is how we're going to roll in our house if the tornado or the winds or, you know, and, and even have different levels. So I'm at that point now, especially my daughter's a lot more sensitive to this. So when we have the tornado warning, now Mm -hmm. okay so you have tornado watch then you have tornado warning tornado watch just like you know the atmosphere could be uh right for a tornado tornado warning is that we've we've spotted something in the area okay whether it's touchdown or not so uh, you know at this point i've trained her listen when we see tornado warning for your sake for our sake let's go down to the bomb shelter Mm -hmm. right and so now she just knows like uh, if she's home by herself, oh, it was a tornado warning. I just went right downstairs. Yeah. Right. That's provided a sense of security for her. Yep. I like it. Yeah. So th- th- this uh, um, mo- moving kind of to the next one, and this is obviously something that uh, I deal with on a regular basis. Let's, this is your area. This is why I brought you in. This, so this take is the it sole away. reason why I'm here. Um, <laughs> so this idea. So when we talk about uh, fires and, and this very idea of preventing fires or protecting your house from a fire or if that fire happens you know what do we do um you know this is something that uh, i live and and breathe every day when i go to work Mm -hmm. and and when we talk about fires there there are in america there are three main causes of fires you know the 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 three the three most prevalent reasons why there's fires in a home in america Mm. there's three reasons um and 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 the first one being cooking we we go on cooking Mm. fires kitchen fires quite often yeah. And, and it's something that happens quite often. Um, the, the next one is portable heaters or, or some, mm. some type of a, an additional heating unit that, that causes heat. We see it right now, obviously, in wintertime. This is something that happens all the time. Is there more, when I think about portable heaters, <clears throat> is it more likely to have problems with, like, uh, an electric portable heater or a gas propane Yeah, type? It's, it's, it's typically the, the electrical. The electric. electrical yep. 
Because th- those are the ones. A lot of times, the the actual coils that there, there's mm. no a lot a lot of times they're again the cheaper ones. There's no mm. shut off on those. They, they just mm. keep running. And then obviously we know electric and heat don't like each other too much because mm. electric produces its own heat. Yeah. And when you when you increase that with a a portable unit, an additional heating source, that's when that's when we get the the, okay. the bad news. Um, and then the, the the third most common cause uh, of, of fires in America is faulty wiring. And again, mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of plays right into the, 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 the portable heating units, right? But faulty wiring, um, we, we get electrical fires, my goodness, all the time. Hmm. All the time. Just because they're so difficult uh, up in a wall or behind, you can't see them typically. Yep, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. So yeah, so so breaking those three down, I think uh, when we talk about um, protecting our home, um, this very idea of cooking uh, and cooking fires, kitchen fires, Man, I cannot tell you the number of times gone into a house where the the stove has caught fire and you mm. look at this stove and you're like, if you would have done a little bit of preventative maintenance on your stove, mm. i.e. clean it, um, man. You it mean, would, yeah, just like there's crud all over. There's it. just stuff all over because I, and I know this from experience, when's the last time you, you turn on your, your stove to cook something in your oven and it smells, or there's a little bit of smoking because stuff has dripped to the bottom, you know, the bottom pan of your your. So your, you're speaking now of the oven itself. The the oven, the, the I mean, I, well, or I mean, even the pan. Yeah, and the, the I, stove. I think there, there's so much to actually just cleaning your 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 stove mm-hmm. and your oven on a on a fairly regular basis because if you use it often, you should be cleaning it often. They mm-hmm. kind of go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, I mean, grease fires we get those a lot. You know, it, I mean, golly, you change your grease out like I, I the, the 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 very very what's to you and I may seem very simple tasks to do it is not necessarily always common knowledge that there even even a, an appliance like a stove or an oven there has to be some maintenance that comes along right. with that right um, so, so the, clean your stove clean, clean your oven clean your, yes <laughs> and, and the, the other thing um, w- which I think is important for for any 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 home is to have fire extinguishers have them in a relevantly close proximity to your kitchen um, they, they make fire extinguishers for kitchens mm-hmm. uh, because again if you're talking grease putting water on your grease is not going to end well, especially if that said grease is on fire. Like mm-hmm. water and grease don't like each other. They, they have a tendency it spreads. to yeah, yeah. It spread. So, so go out and go, go to a, any of the big box stores, go to any hardware store and get a fire extinguisher that is meant for kitchens. I think, I think is, is, is a, is a, is a great way again, because these, these are the things. Yes. So say, say you've cleaned your stove, there's still a potential for there to be a fire, right? right. And, and that, that's when we get into that, that idea that, that we can do everything under the sun to ensure that there's no fire. But at the end of the day, something might happen. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think it's, it's good to be prepared for when that does happen. You know, you're talking about that. And um, I'm going back to my daughter again. She likes to be in the kitchen and she likes to bake. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now she's old enough that it, she has some sense about how those things work. But when she was a little bit younger, uh, a couple of times, Linda and I were gone at work, and she just took it upon herself to start baking cookies and stuff. And, you know, because she, she had seen mom turn the oven on and do all that stuff, but there was lack of connection of understanding, like, well, you can't leave, you know, this out by the oven when you're doing this. And... I mean, I came home one day and she had the house filled with smoke. Mm. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I was just, you know, and it's like, uh, you got it. She, we didn't tell her, no, you can't do that if we're not there. <laughs> you know. Right. Well, it, it just made me think. Of, so you're a fire extinguisher, something that a lot of people don't know. There's actually an acronym when it comes to using your fire extinguisher, and it's called PASS, P-A-S-S. So it's pull. So most fire extinguishers have some form of a pin. Mm-hmm. So pulling that, you're going to aim it, the A, you're going to squeeze, and then you're going to sweep. Um, so in, in basic, basic level fire training, we always we, we teach people when they pick up a fire extinguisher, it's pass, pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Okay. Um, so it, it's a, a good reminder because, again, maybe for me it seems very commonplace to know how to use a fire extinguisher, but for the common person, some, something they may never have an opportunity right. to do, right. it, it's also good because some people start squeezing that, that, that fire extinguisher and they've never pulled out the pin, and that pin is locking it in place so that way if you actually bump your fire extinguisher, it's not going yeah. to go off. 
So pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. There you you know, I can say I'm at my age, I've never used a fire extinguisher on a fire. Mm. I've tested a few just playing around, <laughs> but, but I've, I've never used one on a fire. Yeah. When I when I aim it, do I aim it at the base? Of the, where do I aim it? Is there a better place to aim it on so, the fire? Yeah, so so it, it, it's also going to partially depend on what type of fire it is. So a grease fire, it, again, because it, a grease fire, you are talking about an actual liquid, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. talking about something. So for for a grease fire, I mean, you're, you're always the, the the safe bet is always going to be to aim at the at the seat of the fire. That, okay. That's always going to be a safe bet. Um, but so so, and it's also going to depend on what type of fire extinguisher you have. So that's where just doing basic research on what type of fire extinguisher. Because if it's a water based, if it's a water based fire mm -hmm. extinguisher, and you point and, and you don't know that, I think that's where a little bit of research and th there's different labeling on all the fire extinguisher that'll tell you what I type think there's of like A B C or something. A B C D yeah. and, 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 and there's a K for kitchen. There's, there's okay. A, there's kitchen okay. fire extinguisher so it's got the the the, the, the chemical that, that is needed so a lot of lot of fire extinguishers because some fire extinguishers the per, whole purpose is to cool the fire there's some where it's supposed to smother the fire so there's oh, different wow. there's different ways in which you you can put out a fire using mm -hmm. a fire extinguisher okay so uh, yeah. man i'm learning something there i didn't i didn't know it was that that's why that's why I'm, that's why I'm the guest. That's why no. you're the expert. You're the stud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the the next most common um, you know cause of fire in America is space eaters. Um, mm. And you know we we are doing this show um, and, and and not too long ago uh, you know, a few days ago uh, the city of New York had a tragic oh, wow. fire. Mm -hmm. um, they they had an apartment complex and it it it, it was. That the deemed that the cause of the fire was a space heater, mm. and it killed 17 people, eight of which were kids, and this is this is tragic. This is terrible, and again, not not saying that space heaters can't be used, but but the the, the problem in lies when you're using a space heater or an additional heating source for your house, and then you fall asleep. That that's mm. typically the times when we see that, or or an overloaded, which we'll get into faulty wiring, an overloaded, um, you know, outlet where a space heater is plugged in. Because those space heaters draw a lot of yeah, a lot do. of amps. They, they, yep. they're, they're drawing a lot a lot of, of, of energy to in order to to you know run these space heaters. So a cheaper space heater, man, they, they don't have a, a, a fail proof, right? So they'll just continue to heat until like I I know I I've I've had a couple cheap mm -hmm. space heaters before, and yeah. if, if you turn them on for any length of time, and you touch that wiring, the actual wiring, even though it's insulated wiring, is still hot. Um, so that I, in itself should let you know, like I've had certain um, tools and stuff like that where the wire gets extra hot. Yep. I'm like, nah, something's, this is not right. Yep. Way, way too much resistance in yep. there to heat up. That's not good. And, and most new space heaters now have a tip proof. So if they fall over, they will shut themselves off. Because again, if you <clears> think <throat> about, you know, any hardwood floors, carpeting, something like that. Over over a, a, an extended period of time of continually being heated by that that source, it's going to catch fire. Yeah. So so make sure if you do have a space here, if you are using them, be mindful that that you know don't don't be in a position where you potentially could fall asleep using them because that's never going to end well. Hmm. Because that, if that runs overnight, you're 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 going you're asking for you're asking for trouble. So uh, when it comes to those space heaters, I think it's just you know the New York City just it, when we when I was talking about this and thinking of this, just really reminded me that the tragedy in which those space hmm. heaters can really cause. Not saying you should never use them, just be mindful and be be mature about it. You probably shouldn't put a space heater in your kid's room because they're not going to know that they need to turn that off before right. they go to bed. Or if you could put a timer on it or something yeah. that yes. uh, would automatically shut it down. Yep. Yeah, you know, there's different ways to go about that. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the, the last most common um, you know, fire in America is faulty wiring. And this is something, uh, th this may, may in your mind be one of those where you're like, well, there's not much I can do about that, right? I mean, the, 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 it's behind the walls. We talked about the electrical fires, it's behind the walls. Mm -hmm. Man, I think there's a lot to be said about when you bring an electrician into your house to work on your electric, because it is such a common place to start a fire, man, make sure that electrician knows what the heck they're doing. Like there, 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 there's nothing wrong with asking for certifications for the, these electricians to ensure that, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I, I've attempted to do a few odds and electric. I hate electric. Right. I hate it. For, for multiple reasons, one of which I know the significant damage that it can cause. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot to be said about ensuring that our electric is being done by a professional, by someone who actually knows what the heck they're doing versus because, again, electric, uh, electricity causes heat. And, and if they're faulty wiring, if there's wiring that's not where it's supposed to be, you can cause a lot of damage. Yeah. A lot of damage. Yeah. 
I mean, on, on top of, you know, I talked, I mentioned before, not overloading our outlets is huge. I mean, especially around Christmas time, we just got done with Christmas. <laughs> Golly, like the old Griswold yeah. here. Like, I mean, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, There's yeah. There's only 15 plugs plugged <laughs> into that outlet. That's not bad. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when we go out and do fire inspections, one thing we always look at for, for businesses, again, this is businesses and, and there's different regulations, obviously for your home, I, if, if you want to use uh, extension cords as a permanent fixture, that's obviously on you. We we ensure that our businesses do not use extension cords hmm. for a permanent uh, uh, you know wiring. It's just it's something that's they're, they're, they were never meant to do that. Right. So so I, th- I think it's just a, a, a decent point to make to make sure you know if you do you, if you are using extension cord for a permanent fixture like obviously that it's not what they're they're intended to use for. I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm, I'm not using an extension cord for an extended period of time, but you know that's well, something, it's something we check with our businesses and buy the right extension cord for the job. I mean yep. if you're running heavy amperage equipment um, then you've got to buy an extension cord that can handle that kind of pull so you know uh, around my house I have a couple cheapy extension cords I don't want to be running heavy tools and stuff off of those Uh, I can run a light off of that that's about it you know yep yep so yeah, I mean, th- th- again, th- those are three of the most common reasons why there's a fire in America. Um, you know, man, when we when we start talking about fire prevention and, and protecting our family from from that those very fires, there are there are going to be incidents where fires happen, right? Especially when we talk out in California, the wildland fires. Mm. My goodness, like th- th- there's not much we can do there. We can do a few odds and ends stuff around the house to ensure that you know we are doing preventative maintenance to ensure that you know we can what we can control. We're not going to be you know the, the reason for the fire but at the end of the day stuff happens right you know i I, but speaking of that like out in california out west where these fires are are hitting um at kind of an unprecedented rate now they are talking about no you can't necessarily stop the fire if it's already started but now how we build the house what we build it out of what kind of landscaping we have around it if anything at all Mm -hmm. like all those things are things that can help um, sure reduce the damage and so but and again that may not happen in your house a wildfire like that like we don't tend to have that here in the midwest where we live but out there you know hey as a dad you need to be hey i need to think about what i'm going to do um we have some friends that live out in the colorado area where that fire just ripped through in almost Mm -hmm. a thousand homes and uh, his home is in that neighborhood. Now, his home wow. did not get destroyed. He was just right outside of it. Wow. And they were just talking about how crazy that was. How, mm. you know, it was almost like a tornado that was bouncing around. And it might hit this house, but wow. it doesn't hit that house. So now they're they're rethinking, mm. what do we need to do in this situation? Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about, uh, you know, what, what we do if there is a fire, you know, and, and this is something um, or, or hopefully setting ourselves up for minimal damage. Right. Uh, and one of the, 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 the most common one of the most talked about things is smoke detectors, hmm. uh, ensuring that that we have a smoke detector at the bare minimum, making sure there's a smoke detector on every single floor. Um, the a, a, one step above that is making sure there's a smoke detector in every single room in your house, uh, as far as bedrooms go. Um, I, I, th- this is something to me is uh, yes, they can be a little pricey, right? Depending mm-hmm. on which ones you get, there, there's different. There's there's two different types of smoke detectors, generally speaking. Um, so do a little bit of research. There's photoelectric and ionization. There's two different types of fo- uh, smoke detectors out there, like the, the and and they do different things. So you know, one reads rapid smoke or fire yeah smoke growth one reads very very minimal so again it's going to be dependent on which which type of smoke detector you deem talk to your local fire department they'll be able to direct you as, as far as which one's better for you and your home um so hmm. so ensuring that there's a smoke detector in every single room um checking them regularly my goodness i can't tell you people just th- think that, that there's no maintenance involved in smoke detectors which for the most part there's not right you put them up there and you expect them to do what they're they're right they're, they're gonna do right um this is something that when we do our installations at, at my department when we do insulation something we we always do is we we don't like to put a smoke detector close to the stove and this might seem very counterintuitive because obviously if a stove is Mm -hmm. one of the most common reasons why there's a fire um i don't know about you merle but when i cook i have a tendency to set my that's how we know dinner's ready (laughs) (laughs) but think about this we are all creatures of habit including our kids and if your kids continually hear that smoke detector going Mm. off when you're cooking 
when you're not cooking and there is a fire and they hear that same smoke detector going off, we are creatures of habit, and how many times have, have I done this where I'm cooking and I take the smoke detector off and I pull the batteries out, right, to mm -hmm. set it down so that way it stops going off? So if you are putting your smoke detector in a general area where it's going to go off a lot, your kids are going to be trained to think that that's not a big yeah, deal. They're desensitized. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so j just, just you know, <clears throat> just a, a point of reference. Just not that it shouldn't be in the general vicinity of your kitchen, but probably right over top of the stove is not a good spot for it. Yeah. And and, and then on top of that, testing. My goodness, we need to test our smoke detectors on a fairly regular basis, whether that's monthly, whether that's quarterly, ensuring that you don't just put them up there and you leave it. And and, and just a point on, on the lifespan. So most smoke detectors are good for about ten years. That, that's a generally speaking, and if you're not sure, you can take your smoke detector off and you can read the back of it and it'll tell you how long there's going to be a date that's stamped on every single smoke detector. Mm -hmm. As long as it's a reputable smoke detector, it's not like some something you made in your garage, right? <laughs> there, there will be a date that's stamped on it. It has to be per the federal federal law. There has to be a stamp on the date mm -hmm. that in which it was put in service. Uh, and most smoke detectors will also on the back of it, and this is something because we go on this a lot, there will be um, codes. So if your smoke detector beeps once, it means this, and it'll be on the back of your smoke detector. It'll give mm. you just a, a, a brief description on <clears throat> two beeps means you need to clean the filter out. Three beeps means it's the end of the life of the wh whatever the case may be. But just just check the back of your smoke detectors again, just on basic basic things. Just educating yourself on, on the smoke detector you do have. Yeah, they're a pain in the butt when they need to be replaced or whatever. Like uh, my house is uh, 16 years old and. Um, I did not have a routine where I went and I replaced them all at once, but they all have a life to them. And so yep. they, you know, you can even change the batteries out and stuff. And the one just kept on, <laughs> I took it out in the backyard <laughs> and I shot it. Um, but you, you know, so we, yeah, I've been slowly replacing all of those in the house. Yep. So the, the, this next thing I want to talk about, this is a huge, huge movement in the fire service right now. Um, it's the close before you doze. Um, this is something, um, every single door, I shouldn't say every door, majority of doors in residential structures have some form of fireproofing behind them. Hmm. So right now the big movement is, is closed before you doze. You might have seen billboards up with it, this very slogan on it. Um, it is just a, and this is something, this is gonna, it's gonna be a, a habit to get into for you and your family. Before you go to bed, one of the things you were talking about going around locking your doors, one of the things you should be doing is closing all the doors of every bedroom. Hmm. And, and th this, this is to, because open doors are again one of the one of the things that happened in New York is there was a lot of open doors. Now they were majority more open to you know the hallways where there was right. th where you you ample amount of oxygen that can get to the fire. Um, but it, th there's been proven cases um, of making sure that if your door is closed, it actually is a fire barrier for whoever's in that in, in that bedroom. So hmm. um, you know in the fire service we we always say uh, closed doors and open opportunity for finding a victim because a, a, realistically speaking, if that door is closed, there's a good opportunity for there somebody to be safe behind that door. So um, just, just talking to your kids, and this is gonna be, again, this is gonna be something hard because if your kids are normally used to sleeping with the door open, mm -hmm. to, to then close the door, that's when you know you have to tell your kids about, you know, there's no monsters and so on and so yeah. forth. But it, it, it's a really good practice to shutting your, shutting your doors before you go to bed. That is a tough one because, um you know, we've had our kids, um, when we adopted our kids, they were all very fearful um, of nighttime and dark. And so not only did they want the doors open, but they also wanted lights on, right? Yeah. Like they, I'm like, how do you sleep in here? <laughs> it's like sunshine. Yep. And so it took us a good year or so, maybe longer than that, even for a couple of them, where we slowly... Um, close those doors down and yep. we are able to close them but try to keep a light on especially you know like for the the fear factor um and that was the reasoning we also took some time too though if you close the door and you feel like you know you have to get out <clears throat> how they can get out other yeah. than the door whether it's a window or sure. something like that and you know luckily my kids are not on any like second or third floor so they could get out a window relatively easy. Yeah, yeah. Easily. So, which, which that brings up a, a great, a great point. That this, um, you know, they they they, have, they put acronyms and everything in the fire service, like, um, but they, they named it Edith, E D I T H. So exit drills in the home. Okay. Um, so this this is something we we you know whenever we do prevention, whenever we we talk to to kids, making sure you have an exit 
in your home, making sure mm-hmm. you know um, a safe place you're going to go, that if your, fi- your house is on fire, you, this is where you're going. You're leaving all your stuffed animals behind. You are making a beeline here because on the fire fire uh, you know department side, we, we are going to find a group of people and we're going to say, who's still inside? Mm. We're still going to search it. Hopefully, hopefully your fire department believes this. We're still going to search it because, you know, w- w- in the heat of the moment, you're not thinking logically. So if your daughter has someone stay the night, you may not think that. So hopefully your fire department is, is, is aggressive and going to go in there and, and, and search that space still. But but having having, uh, you know, a, a drill, ha- having a place where your kids know that they're going to go to that that is again, this is something maybe maybe a lot of people don't know preferably not close to the street because if your house is on fire you are going to get five six seven eight fire apparatus that those guys are in their emotions are, are running high because there is a structure of fire that your someone's house on fire and they're there to do a job and not to say that the person driving those vehicles is not going to be paying attention but that's just one less thing that they have to worry about. So preferably keeping that safe place for your kids away from the street, keep, mm. keeping them somewhere far away. And this is something, man, if your house, God forbid your house is on fire, do not call 911 and then go get your kids. And this may sound really stupid to say, but it happens every day in America. Get your kids, get them out of the house, and then call 911. Mm. Because depending on where you live, 911 may be, there may be a hold. Right. You, right, you may be right. waiting two or three minutes before someone actually picks up. To, again, depending on where you're at in America, um, some of the rural areas of, of America, you know, they, they don't have a yep. 911 dispatcher that's waiting to answer your right. phone call yeah. right away. So, getting your kids out of the house, and then you know, if you have to go to a neighbor's house, if you have to go get someone else's phone, then make that phone call. That's and again, it's, it sucks because you know, every every minute that you're you know, someone's not putting the fire out, that fire is growing <clears throat> exponentially. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one of the last points when it comes to the actual, you know, when, when it comes to preventing and protecting your home, how are you going to respond? Mm-hmm. I think this is really important. We talk all the time about trying to maintain a, a level sense, keeping emotions out of it. When it comes to your house on fire, it's going to be very, very difficult. But again, you as the strong dad need to be that steady, steady Eddie, right? You need to, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I know that if I'm unable to get to my girl's room, I'm going through a wall, right? Yeah. I, I, and I tell my girl all the time, if mom and dad are home, we're not leaving upstairs without you. You're mm-hmm. coming with us, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and ensuring and let them know that you are there. You're going to protect them. You're going to do whatever it takes to ensure that they're getting out. Uh, we talk all the time with our girls about feeling the doorknob. If the doorknob's hot, you're not going out. You're going to stay in there. You're going to tuck. Mm-hmm. You're going to tuck. You know what blankets underneath the the, the, the doorway to, to keep the smoke from coming. So talking about this thing, and, and talking about it in a sense of uh, of calm, right? So if this happens, this is what we're going to do. And it, very matter of fact about it. No no second guessing it. If they ask questions and you don't know the answers, man, talk to your local fire department. Mm-hmm. Which, which which truly is my last point. We in America, and I say this because I am a fireman, we need to do a better job of holding our firemen accountable. Mm-hmm. And I say this because, again, I this is what I do. Call your local fire department and ask them when the last time those guys did training. You expect the firemen, when you call 911, you expect them to show up and do the job that they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And this is something that I take very personal <clears throat> because the firemen that are protecting my house, I hope they feel and are as aggressive as I am. I mm-hmm. want the firemen to show up to my house to have a like mind that I am. Not that I'm perfect by any means. I make a lot of mistakes in my job, but I I, I go to the I go to the drawing board, right? I, I go I go to multiple trainings a year to ensure that I can be the best fireman out there. Yeah. So hold your fire departments accountable. There's nothing wrong with calling them and say, when's the last time your guys did training? When's the last time that those guys did a real world exercise where they knew you know, they, they know how to do search patterns. Like, hold your fire departments accountable. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You're paying for their salaries. Hold them accountable. Mm. How different is it um, when you're in a volunteer fire department versus a professional fire department? Like Vastly what, different. Yeah, because, yeah. I, I mean, I in our area, it's mostly volunteer, um, but maybe a couple, you know, professional guys there. So the well, whole training se- aspect 70, is 70% tough. of America is still volunteer. Yeah. 70% yeah. of the, the, the fire service is still volunteer. So it, it, it is a, it's a struggle, right? But those volunteers are still, they're still responding to structure fires. Right. Just because you're volunteer versus, it, it, you know, paid. Well, and if you're going to volunteer, you should still take the time to get trained up because Absolutely. this is not a laughing matter. Not I at mean, all. You wouldn't, you know, that, that's a big deal. So yep. if you're doing it just because your buddies are volunteers and it's a good thing to hang out to do on a weekday night, that's not probably a good reason to be yep. a volunteer fireman. 
So yeah, th- th- those those are just few Ozan and stuff um, that I picked up <clears throat> on it, and 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 you know the, the clothes before you doze is a really really big one right now. Um, there, there's a lot of good practice and a lot of good studies that have shown that that is that, that is greatly beneficial. So if nothing else, you take away from this clothes before you doze is, is a really good one. Good good deal. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. All I right. mean that's that's a lot of good stuff. I think the takeaway from this is. First and foremost, let's be intentional about protecting our our family and our home, the physical structure, the the people that are there. Um, you, it doesn't take long. As a man, you should walk through that house. You should know the layout of the house. Like in our house, we have doors to get into the rooms, but I also know how to bust into every ho- every room. If the door's not there, I, I mean, I know where the drywall is. I know where, yeah. you know what, I'll, just like you said, no matter what, I will go in and I can bust through closet drywall and Absolutely. get people. So just because there's a wall there doesn't mean I don't have access. Yep. But as the man, I don't know that, you know, a lot of people would think that way. But that's part of our job to know how we can get what we need to get. Yep, I like it. You have to, if if nothing else, start start going over. If you don't already have have an exit plan for your kids, teach them the the way in which they're going to get out of their house. Go go through those steps and do it do it in a very calm calm manner. It's a very matter of fact. This is what we're going to do if this if this happened. Yeah, one of the biggest killers in all these situations are emotions. When emotions run amok and people panic. And that's why, you know, I've referred to many times in the school systems, we run monthly fire drills. Yep. And so we can get, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred kids out of a building in a matter of minutes. Yep. And they do it calmly. And that's how we keep people safe. And so in your own home, your kids just need to know, hey, this is what we do in these situations, whether it's a storm, a fire, whatever. Yep. So, all right. Well, we want to thank you guys. Hopefully this is just uh, something to open your eyes to get you thinking. Uh, this was a very practical show and and hopefully a useful show. Um, so we want to thank you guys for listening. Do us a favor, continue to listen to our shows and and share our shows. We need you guys' help as we continue to grow and get out there with these messages. Looking for guests as well. If you, if you have a guest uh, or you have a person, personality that you think would offer a great insight or experience, um, share their name with us. These yeah. are We're always looking for just great stories and inspiration, uh, ways to challenge men. So help us out with that. That would be really cool. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors, the uh, Crimer's Beer House and Casey's Outdoor Solutions. We want to thank these guys for coming alongside and, and helping us do what we do here at Strong Dads. I like it. Thank, thanks got, for thanks for having me on the show, Marlon. You, you I'm going to give you a I'm going to give you a B plus. On, right, I can on, take that. <laughs> I can live with a B plus. I'll give you an A. Jeez, that <laughs> that hurts me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Really do appreciate you guys. Go out there and be some strong dads. Hey, this is Kyle Carver from Strong Dads. Strong Dads podcast would love to thank the Crimer's Beer House for coming alongside of us. The Crimer's Beer House was started in 1982 by the Crimer family, and since that time, they have definitely become a Cincinnati favorite. So if you're looking for an incredible meal in an incredible setting, definitely go down to Route 128 and check out the Crimer's Beer House.